our series in the book of Haggai. And actually, it's a very short series. We've done three messages, and there's actually only two left. Um, and, you know, if, 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 if you were to look at, at Haggai like a poem, it would be A, B, B, A, C. You guys know what I'm talking about? A, B, B, A, C. So there's A, which was our first message, which was talking about giving careful thought. That was repeated twice in the first passage. That's being repeated twice again in this passage. The B was, I am with you. The presence of God that was repeated in, in both passages that we just went over. And then C is kind of the bonus message for next week. So I just kind of keep that, yeah. <laughs> keep you in suspense on that. But let me read the passages from Haggai 2, verses 10 to 19. So again, that's Haggai 2, verses 10 to 19. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priest what the law says. If someone carries consecrated meat in the fold of their garment, and that fold touches some bread or stew, some wine, olive oil, or other food, does it become consecrated? The priest answered, no. Then Haggai said, if a person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, does it become defiled? Yes, the priest replied, it becomes defiled. Then Haggai said, so it is with this people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer there is defiled. Now give careful thought to this from this day on. Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came to a heap of 20 measures, there were only 10. When anyone went to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were only 20. I struck all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. From this day on, from this 24th day of the ninth month, give careful thought to the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought. Is there yet any seed left in the barn? Until now, the, the vine and the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not yet borne fruit. From this day on, I will bless you. So to kind of help illustrate this, I'm going to talk about two different trees in my life. Okay, it's going to sound kind of strange at first. And I'm going to try to explain what these trees mean. Okay, but this first tree, there, there used to be a very big tree in my front yard um, in, in the house that I grew up at. It was a really big tree. It was kind of the center of the yard, the center of life. And I, I had a lot of memories. We had like kind of a really shabby swing that was hanging off that eventually broke. Um, but there's this big tree, and it was the center of the whole yard. Everything went around this tree. Um, there weren't furry animals. It's just a picture to illustrate. All right, next slide. And I remember even like there was a nest, a bird's nest. I remember as a child, um, there's you know, this bird came and built a nest. I was I was amazed. And then it laid eggs, and there were some, you know, little little chicks, right? And I remember getting up really close and seeing them and seeing how ugly they are. Um, next slide, please. And that's when I found out the hard way that if you actually, you know, get too close to the birds, the mother bird doesn't come back. And so these little chicks died <laughs> because I was curious. <laughs> anyway, sad story. Next, next slide. But what happened was. As I was growing up, I grew up in an area where there were cicadas. You guys know what cicadas are, right? They have them in Korea. I think Korea, they come out every year. What's the word in Korean? Emi. Emi? Emi? Okay. So in, in Korea, they come out every year. But I lived in an area where these were 16-year cycle cicadas. So they only came out once every 16 years. So most of the time, they were underground sleeping, right? And then and that 16th year, they would come out and they would take over the entire area. It was a really scary thing for me. Because for you guys, you guys live with yearly cicadas, so they don't, they don't like, just come out of nowhere, right? But here, I never saw a cicada in my life, because I was a little kid. And then all of a sudden, the whole area was filled with cicadas and all the noise, you know, that, 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 the noise that cicadas make, right? And then like, the, they would keep shedding and like, there, like, uh, there would be like skin everywhere. It's disgusting. And as a little kid, I was freaked out because cicadas are big and black and they got red eyes. And they're everywhere. I was really scared as a kid. And these cicadas really liked this tree. And they're always feeding off of this tree. 
they were sucking the sap out of this tree. And I saw this as a child. And what ended up happening was, when cicadas come out after a 16 year hibernation, they're extremely hungry. You would be hungry too if you slept for 16 years, I'm sure. And so they of course devour everything. And they had, they had, you know, sucked so much of the sap out of the tree that they basically killed the tree. But on the outside, it looked fine. So this very big tree that was the, the center of our yard, the center of all the life in our yard, it still looked fine outwardly, but inwardly it was dying, it was decaying. Ooh. <laughs> that was not intended. Um, next slide, please. And so my dad chopped the tree down. The reason why was because... You can go back. So my dad chopped the tree down because th this tree that on the outside looked fine, he realized was now a threat to us. Because the tree was actually very close to our house and it was very tall. So if it fell the wrong way, you know, it was going to damage our house. So this tree that, that looks fine on the outside, that's dying on the inside, suddenly became a threat to us. So my dad killed the tree. It was kind of sad. I went from this big tree to a little stump, you know, in a matter of minutes. Next tree. So for me, growing up, I've always loved Asian pears. Hey. I also like, you know, American pears too, but when you look at the two side by side, there's no comparison. Like, well, <laughs> what, what is this little thing? It even looks like not that appetizing when you compare them side by side. You can, you can click. I'm going to put a little X there. There you go. <laughs> not that kind of pear, but Asian pears, these, these big old Asian pears that like you start biting into it and the juice just starts running down your arm and you're like, eh. <laughs> right? It's just so good, it's like just juice just pouring out of it. Probably one of my favorite treats is an Asian pear. Now my dad, um, he's an agriculture major actually, so he's kind of an agricultural ninja. And so what he did was, um, a friend of his had a, a, an Asian pear tree, so he went and he pulled off a branch off that Asian pear tree and he grafted it onto one of our existing trees. Right? Kind of a crazy thing, right? He grafted it and it kept growing to the point where it could become its own tree. And so my dad took it off that, that, you know, that tree that it kind of you know, grafted on, planted it, and it became its own, a new you know, Asian pear tree. Okay? And I was excited because I loved Asian pear. And I was like just dying to, to you know, grab it and then just have a tree that would keep bearing more and more Asian pear. I was really excited. And he told me, it's going to take seven years. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a young, like, I don't even think I was seven years old at the point. And I was like, really? <laughs> That's a lifetime. <laughs> right? And so I, I kept waiting, and every year I would look at that, that branch, or it had become a tree at this point, and I would stare at it, mouth water, and just waiting for it to bear something. Like, Please, bear some pet. And what ended up happening was, um, you know, we were living kind of in this farm area, but we were actually going to move to a nicer neighborhood. And just before we moved, this really tiny Asian pear came out. Really small. It didn't even look like a pear. It was like it almost looked like a small apple. And I remember it didn't taste very good either. And so my dad said, okay, we're moving too, so let's bring the tree with us. So we brought the tree with us to our new place, planted it, and it never bore anything. <laughs> Nothing. It was a worthless tree. <laughs> and, what, and so for me, every time I saw that tree, I would get angry. <laughs> also because, um, you know, like, we had a yard and I would have to mow the lawn. And I hated mowing the lawn. Right? I hated mowing the lawn. And so we would mow the lawn and I would always have to mow around this tree. And every time I saw this tree, I was just tempted to just mow over it. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to end you. <laughs> you just bore us that one little pet. After all these years that I've waited. And so that was a, a time of frustration for me. It was watching this worthless tree that my dad had kind of done some crazy things with that didn't actually do anything. Right? So next slide. There, there's two trees that I'm talking about here. There's one. The first one, it looked dead or it looked alive on the outside. It looked huge and strong, but inside was dying and became a threat became a danger. 
The second was a tree that just wouldn't bear any fruit. And if anything, did not deserve to live. <laughs> so I'm going to use these two as an analogy to continue on. Okay. So if we look at the passage, the first part of the passage talks about, you know, these things about like consecration, defilement. And it talks about, you know, basically at, at this point, God is kind of recapping what had happened to Israel at that point. Now to, for us to recap, if you turn to the next slide, um, in these past three messages, there, there's just to refresh you on what we've talked about. In the first one, God reminds the people, you came here for a purpose. You came here to build my house, my temple. And for 16 years, you gave up. For 16 years, you were building your own house. And he's reminding them, consider your ways. Give careful thought to what you're doing. The time is now. Don't argue about when to build my house. Do it right now. And the people respond and they obey. And God turns back and says, now that you have obeyed me, don't forget, I am with you. My presence has always been with you. Be empowered, be encouraged. And you see, once they realize that God's presence is with them, they're empowered to move forward and start building. That presence empowers them. Next, God continues to remind them because he sees disappointment in some of them. He sees people that live before and seen the glory of the former temple and see that this one is going to be smaller and it's not going to be as awesome. And God says, I recognize your disappointment, but there will be a greater glory that is coming. Remember that I am with you. My presence is with you. And my presence and my glory be fully revealed. Now we realize that that never happened with the temple, but it was realized with Jesus Christ that He truly was God dwelling with His people, and He truly was the glory of the Father for all people to see. And in the midst of that, God is reminding them, remember what happened. Next slide. So what he shows us through, through this law, through, through this interpretation of the law by the priest, is that holiness is not something that you can just transfer to something else by touching it. Right? A priest cannot make something holy by just touching it. But something that is corrupt, something that is ugly before God, is easily transferred to other things. That was something the law taught. And what that teaches us is that it's so easy for corruption to spread. But holiness, on the other hand, it's not that easy. If you think about it, attaining holiness is one of the most difficult things. Losing that. Or, or just falling under corruption, falling into sin, is probably one of the easiest things. That's the contrast that we're given here. And what God is telling the people is that when you abandon my temple, when you disobeyed me, that corrupt attitude, that ugliness in your heart spread everywhere. And that worship that you thought you were still giving me during those 16 years was ugly to me. Next slide, please. And so basically, God is telling them, because of the ugliness in your heart, on the outward, you look fine. You think you're fine. But on the inside, you're dying. You're like that dead tree. Except, on the outside, you look fine, but I see the inside when you come in. And he talks about how if someone who touches a dead thing basically becomes like a dead thing to him. And so if we're applying this to our understanding of worship, if we're in disobedience, if we're filled with just ugliness of sin, the darkness of sin, externally, we can fake it. Right? Externally, we can show that we're, we're, you know, we're, we're doing just fine. And I think in, in uh, Chi Won's testimony, he shared a lot about that, on how he was able to fool people because he knew how to act. But God sees what you really are. 
And so if we're dying inside, what God sees is not the external. God sees a corpse coming into the church. God sees the full ugliness. And that's what had happened to the people of Israel. They had become a defiled people. That worship that they were giving every week to God was unacceptable to Him. Because all they saw was their ugliness. So there's a word of caution there. That for those of us that are struggling, for those of us that are wrestling with different things, we can't hide that from and when we come and, and we think, you know what, I'm still worshiping God. I'm still, you know, doing my week in, week out thing with Him. We're still good. That's not true. God sees what you really are. God sees what's really going on with you. And in that sense, like that dead tree in my, in my front yard, it became a threat. It became a threat to our house. It became a threat to our livelihood. It became a threat to itself. And so I'm pleading with you, for those of you that are, are wrestling with different things, don't keep vacuuming. Know that, that God desires to restore you. God desires to cleanse you. God desires to wash you anew. He wants you to turn back to Him. And He will stop at nothing to do that. Next slide, please. Disobedience is what disgusts the Lord. Disobedient hearts, disobedient attitudes. You know, when you look all throughout Scripture, what God desires most isn't for us to sacrifice, isn't for us to, to keep pushing all these things unto Him. The thing that honors God the most is when we obey Him. And for those of you that are parents, I think you can understand that. The thing that you would love the most about your child isn't so much about what they achieve, but it's about them obeying. And I'm not, you know, I don't have kids. I don't know this. <laughs> I'm hoping that that will change soon. But regardless, you know, I, I can understand that. That that's how you communicate love to a parent. Is by obeying even without being asked. God desires our obedience. That's what Haggai is about. God is asking them, obey me and build my house. Stop focusing on your own. And when the people said they would obey, God says, I will bless you. Next slide, please. All throughout Scripture, all throughout, especially the Old Testament, God always says, return to me. I think the Hebrew word is shuv. I don't know why I said that, just to show off that I know Hebrew. But regardless, return to me. Turn back. Constantly, all throughout the Old Testament. Now, a lot of people, when they read the Old Testament, they're like, wow, why is God so angry? You know, a lot of people interpret God as just this very angry God. And to an extent, there is truth. There is anger there. But to put it in a different perspective, the Israelites had entered a relationship with God. They had entered a covenant relationship. Essentially, they had become married to God. And as an unfaithful spouse, they were constantly cheating and rejecting God. Think about that. If you're married... And the person that you married is constantly cheating on you, is constantly disobeying you, is constantly running away from you. I think you'd have reason to be a little upset. <laughs> and I think that's part of what you see. But, but rather than the anger, what I really see when I look at this passage, when I look at God constantly pleading with His people to return to me. And even in this passage, God saying, I'm making things difficult on you because I want you to turn back to me. He's going to extreme measures to pull them back to Him. What I see is not an angry God. What I see is a lovesick God. A God that knows that if, these, if they continue to go down that path, they're going to hurt themselves more. And He says, you know what? 
I have to hurt you a little bit so that you don't hurt yourself even more. It pains him even to do that to them, but he does it for the sake of bringing them back. What I see is a lovesick God. And a God that, in spite of rejection, presses on. Now, last time I spoke, I talked a lot about how I got rejected a lot. <laughs> so I understand what this is like. But unlike God, I gave up. <laughs> the amazing thing is, no matter how, how many times we reject Him, no matter how many times we disobey Him, God will still keep pursuing us to the furthest extreme that he would actually sacrifice his son for us. Hallelujah. God never gave up. God never gave up on us. Next slide, please. And so, I got a little crazy with the alliteration here, frustrated by the fruitless futility of their lives. Um, regardless, you know, Moving onward, you see that in the midst of what's going on, in the midst of the difficulties of their lives, these people are crying out for something. And actually, if you go to the dating of the passage, it's probably around December of the year. And so they've just planted the seeds, and they don't really know what to expect for the coming spring. Right? And up until this point, year after year, they've been disappointed. Like me and that stupid pear tree. Right? Every year I would look at it and nothing would come out. Same thing with them. Every year they would plant, nothing would grow. Or the things that would grow, nothing would, would bear fruit. Right? And they have just planted their seeds and God is telling them, from this day on. Actually, next slide, please. God's first reminding them, the seeds have already been planted. The fruit is going to come. So for those of you in your lives that are, that are dealing with frustration right now, dealing with struggles of not knowing what to do next, of not knowing you know, what, what you're even doing, God wants to remind us that the seeds have already been planted. And He will make them grow. You know, we're looking, uh, as it's in this passage, and we're looking at our, at our barn, and the seeds are already gone because we already planted them, and we don't know what's next. And we're saying, God, I don't, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. He's saying, if you turn back to me, if you obey me, those seeds have already been planted. I will bless you, my child. Now, that actual blessing doesn't necessarily turn out to be material wealth or, or physical health. Sometimes it does, but not all the time. You know, if you actually get to the history of this passage, they would continue to struggle economically. So God didn't actually answer it in the direct way that they thought he would. But the heart to bless, that desire to bless them, was always there. So what I want us to really reflect upon and to remember is that that is the heart of the Father. Next slide, please. That from this day on, His desire is to keep blessing us. From this day on. Now at this point, this is when they've laid the foundation. And now they're at the point where they're able to start laying the stones down for the temple. So this is a very significant moment. And God is honoring that moment by saying, you've obeyed me. It took you 16 years. But you finally obeyed me. And from this day on, I will bless you. And so brothers and sisters, what I really want you, what I really encourage you to, to do is seek in your heart, God, is there any area of disobedience in my life? What are the areas in which I have not fully given unto you. What are the areas in which that I, I try to keep away from you? And Father, if there is disobedience in my life, reveal it to me. And give me the strength. Fill me with your presence 
Empower me with your presence so that I can obey you. That's what I'm encouraging you guys to do today. It's to give careful thought. Remember the depths from which God has taken you from. And to not allow compromise. To not allow ourselves, you know what, to rationalize. You know what, God, I can, it's okay if I do this, right? I want us to, to really try to take that next step forward. And I really encourage us as a body to be willing to hold each other accountable to these things. You know, the one beauty about having kind of a generation gap like we do in this body <laughs> is that, at least for you younger folk, you have big brothers and big sisters that you can you know, really count on and that can share a lot of wisdom with you. And so I'm hoping that we can build more relationships like that. Where we can really hold each other accountable, really encourage each other, really pray for each other. And see the blessing of God in our lives. So let's take a moment to pray into this. Let's take a moment to, to really seek out and root out the areas of disobedience in our lives. And let's pray that God would give us the power, the strength, the courage, and the presence to press on. Let's take a moment to just find those things, find those areas in our lives and just offer them up to the Lord right now. Let's pray that He would allow us to obey, that He would encourage us to do so. Let's pray. One of, of a tree that's that's dying on the inside and that looks fine on the outside. Another that wasn't bearing fruit. Let's pray that we would be neither of those. Let's pray that we would be a healthy, strong tree that is rooted in the Word of God, that is that is receiving its life and its sustenance from Him, and that as He continues to fill us, that we're naturally bearing. We're naturally just bountiful. So let's pray that, that God would, would, would help us to, to find that, that sustenance and growth in Him. Let's pray that we could change to be a healthy, fruitful tree. Let's pray.
Father, thank you for not abandoning us. That no matter how many times we've rejected you, no matter how many times we've disobeyed, you have never stopped pursuing us. Giving your only son, reaching into our lives, Thank you, we praise you for that. But in our hearts, Lord, we pray, Lord, that we would turn back to you. That if there is any area in our lives that we are wrestling with in disobedience, we pray that you would bring revelation, and that you would bring providence in surrounding us with brothers and sisters that would encourage us, mentors that would lead us and guide us. would be healthy, firmly rooted trees that are bearing fruit because you are constantly filling us with your word, with your spirit, with your presence. Be glorified through this Lord. May we receive that blessing that you desire to give. Thank you, Lord. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.